Stephen Yanni, and we're continuing here with Project Rem Charger, the 62 Dodge Dart four-door former police car, 318 polypower back when? Well, now it's going to have a 513 Ram Charger, cross Ram Max Wedge engine, complete with the undercar dump pipes, all that stuff. But it all starts with this right here. This is our 440 engine. Uh, so far in this video series, we've introduced the car, of course, but we've also stripped this motor down, and now we're about to remove the external pumps and then pull the oil pan and get ready to really strip this thing right right down so the block can go to the machine shop and get overboard and become a 513. That's a little later on. But in the meantime, we have some observations to make. This water pump assembly right here is typical of all 350, 361, 383, 400, 413, 426, 440 engines. But there's a small difference. You can see how the outlet down here goes straight down. That's indicative of a truck application right there or a motorhome. Automobiles go straight out the side. A few different configurations and they all come in from the top. But with that said, when you see that, that's truck stuff. You cannot use that on your passenger car unless it's like a tube frame hot rod or something like that. Okay, so off with this. Now these are available either from Mopar Performance or from 440 Source, etc. in aluminum. This is a cast iron structure, kind of heavy. So the aluminum piece saves a lot of weight. So that's a nice little hop up trip if you want to do it. Okay, here's the front cover off. The fuel pump on this one is the uh, two udder type, I call it. There's also a thing called a hemi pump, which is a much larger structure that moves more fuel. But again, for this motorhome single four barrel, here's the fuel pump. Let's pull that thing off of there. And there's the push rod, uh, or the lever arm right there. There's a push rod inside of here that actuates this off of the camshaft. So just a basic, uh, unremarkable fuel pump, mechanical and air techs device. Now these engines, uh, again, the 440, the 413, and the 426 wedge all share the same 3.75 inch stroke. Uh, that said, the 413 has a smaller 4.18 inch bore. Uh, the 426 street wedge has a 4.25 inch bore, and the big guy, the 440, has a 4.32 inch bore bore right here, 4.32 inches. Now this is going to grow from 440 to 513 cubic inches through a 30 thousandths bore increase and additional stroke, courtesy of a crankshaft from 440 source. But with that said, let's learn a little bit about this block. You know, there's a couple places you can look on these things to see what they're made of. And uh, I like to take my Dave Wise MMC Detroit decoding book right here and have a peek at the various things. Now down low on all engines from say 68 on up, there's a machine pad right here that generally has the VIN and stuff like that. This one has nothing, which is actually not uncommon for truck and van pen. So there's nothing going on there. Uh, not a big thing. Here, the raised pad on the front of the block, something you find only on 413 and 426 and 440s and a handful of 383 raised X. Right here we see T440E. This tells us it's a cast crank 440. If this had HP or anything like that, it would be a little cooler. But again, here's the build date, 2, 3 of, you know, who knows when. Speaking of which, let's go to, again, that side of the block. And there's going to be a birthday cast into it. And... Yeah, there it is right there. We see this was originally uh, cast, oh yeah, 11, 12, 7, 4. So this was cast November 12th, 1974, and probably went into a 1975 vintage uh, motorhome. Um, so that's the story there. And again, books like this are very helpful. In some cases, you'll see a whole alphabet soup of numbers and letters stamped into these pads. And these books are really helpful at decoding and finding out what those things all mean and what they don't mean. So anyway, there's that. Uh, the lifters on this thing, let's pull the lifters out and have a look and see what they're like. Now again, this is a hydraulic cam engine. And here is uh, one of the lifters. Looks pretty decent. Now you never reuse a flat tappet lifter. Uh, the only exception might be if you're like stuck on Gilligan's Islands and you have no choice. But if that ever happens, mark every single lifter. Be sure that it goes back to the cam lobe that it originally was matched with. And you have a shot at that living. If you mix up the lifters, uh, you can pretty much guarantee that they'll find new wear patterns. And uh, in doing so, you'll increase the amount of wear and it won't last long. The camshaft will be worn down and you'll be in some trouble. But again, we're going to be installing a, uh, an aftermarket camshaft in this one, so we're not worried about that at all. 
So again, the lifters go into the trash bin. These are hydraulics. And again, a hydraulic lifter is a multi-piece affair. It has an inner plunger, a little spring, and a snap ring keeps it together. And oil pressure fed into this thing at 0, 70, 80 PSI creates sort of a shock absorber effect. So the motion from the lobe of the camshaft to the ball of the push rod is cushioned by the piston inside of the lifter. And again, that's all about, um, well, two things. It, it adjusts for wear automatically. There's no need to take it up at the end of the rocker arm with an, adja uh, an adjuster or a lash setter. Uh, and beyond that, uh, a hydraulic lifter also is quieter. Um, but the negative side of hydraulic lifters is that they have, there's a thing called lifter pump up at around 5,500 RPM or maybe 65 on a really good cam and a good lifter set of high performance stuff. Uh, the lifter actually goes into like sort of a, a shock state and begins to float the valves. It can't keep up. But a solid lifter, well, it pretty much will hang in there until something else breaks. So hydraulic lifters are good for say 6,200 RPM and below performance use, which is what we're probably going to do. The downside to solid lifters is the need for occasional maintenance. You have to adjust the valve lash. Uh, usually it's 28 thousandths, 32 thousandths intake and exhaust, something like that, um, in order to, uh, to uh, compensate for wear and also just normal, you know, getting out of adjustment. Now, one thing too is inside here, we'll see this right here. This is the intermediate shaft, that thing right there. This is the thing here that is driven by the camshaft, that gear, and this is what also turns the distributor at the top and the oil pump at the bottom. Now these are available with a heavy duty tip that is m more shear proof. Now I've never seen one of these things come apart in an engine, but if this thing ever comes apart at high RPM uh, or with a lot of oil pressure, you will have no oil pressure, but the engine will continue to run. So with that said, Mopar Performance does sell high performance uh, distributor drives or intermediate shafts, this thing right here. Um, we'll probably do that. Now at the back of these engines, the all Mopar big blocks, you'll find something here. This is called the flex plate. And these are held on, in this case, with six bolts. If you have a Hemi and you're lucky, there's gonna be eight bolts back here. Now a handful of times you'll find a hot rotted 440 or 413 or 426 with a Hemi crank in it. Uh, and that's always gonna be an indicator of uh, six, or sorry, eight bolts back here. But don't confuse early 413s, which is gonna be like a 59, 60, 61, 62, 61. Uh, eight bolts on the back, uh, eight holes I should say, but they're actually gonna have a nut and a bolt to hold on the torque converter plate. Uh, the modern stuff from 62 up, the aluminum 727 torque flight will all, all have bolts, but again, if you see six, it's a common wedge, max wedge even, eight, you got yourself a hemi piece. So let's take this puppy off of here. And at the front of the crank, where we earlier saw in another uh, video, E telling us it's a cast crank engine. Indeed, we go to the balancer or the damper, you choose. And on the front, we can see right here, it's fairly thick. It has an eccentric here, and it actually says, use with 440 cast crank only, right there. This eccentric, which basically is an offset weight, is there only on cast crank 440s. And the cast crank arrived like in 72, 73. It's lighter than the forge crank that was used before that time. It's not as strong. They're still good for like 500 horsepower and even a little bit more if they're machined properly. But again, because the cast crank was so light, the internal balancing used previously with the forge cranks no longer worked. So they had to add weight to each end of the crank, thus this wacky harmonic damper with that. And in fact, there's a couple varieties of this. There's one here, has the same message, used with 440 cast crank, but it's tapered, that kind of weird, it's not squared off. So these things uh, take a few different forms, but whenever you see this eccentric, this uh, non-even weight, that's a sign of a cast crankshaft lurking within. Now with that said, because we're gonna be using a 440 sourced billet stroker crank uh, to take this thing out to 513 cubes, we don't really care, but that's the story there. Okay, let's remove this puppy, and I've already hit this thing with the air, and uh, it's a big, uh, what is this, a, a one and a quarter inch socket. You basically just take this nut right off of here, and then you break out the pulling tool the puller, I should say, this guy right here, and put this in place right here. Now, Mopar crankshafts are pretty well known for being, 
you know, not, not the best in the business, but they were forged for a lot longer than they had to be. And while Pontiac, I don't think ever had a forged crankshaft in like a 389. I know some of the 421s and stuff like that. And of course the Super Duty 455s did have forged guts. Uh, when you get down to like the 389 GTO engine and stuff like that, those are all cast inside, which is, you know, it's kind of a little disappointing. Meanwhile, Chrysler, the 383 two barrels and just the really pedestrian stuff, they all had forged guts, which is kind of nice. And the beauty of a forged crankshaft is that the potential is there to support far more horsepower than it ever would have made in stock trim. So, you know, as a hot rodder, to find a forged crank in anything is always kind of a, a major confidence booster because you know that you're not going to put your money into an engine that's just going to blow itself apart or can't hang in there because of the changes you've made. So that's the beauty of a forged crank. But again, on this 440, the forged crank can't, can't hurt us because we're not going to be using it. But again, I've seen people with forged cranks uh, run them, oh, you know, four or 500 horsepower without any problem at all. And keep in mind, too, with a 440, the horsepower is only part of the picture. The torque is the other part of the equation. And so, you know, you might only have 410 horsepower, but you might have 550 foot-pounds of torque. So uh, either way, the car is going to get down the track pretty well. Another detail about forged cranks, or cast cranks, excuse me, like this one here, is at the other end. Let's take a quick peek down the other end real fast. Um, if you want to run a manual transmission with a cast crank, Good luck. Here's why. If we look in this hole right here, this is the pilot at the end. You can see right here, it's not drilled out, it's solid. There's no hole right there. So on a forged crank, what you would have there is a hole about as big as your pinky. And that would allow the input shaft or the pilot shaft or the four-speed or even a three-speed manual to stick into the crank. On a cast crank 440 or 383 or 400, um, you don't have that option. Now there are some who say that you can indeed use a manual transmission and cut that pilot shaft off uh, and get away with it. I've never tried it. It just doesn't seem right because that pilot shaft on the front of the tranny needs to be supported. You know, you just think that it wouldn't be a good thing at all to, uh, to have that input shaft floating in the air without a bushing in place or a, otherwise being piloted. But that's the, that's the deal. Okay, off with this thing. It's nice that came off real sweet. The front cover on these things is a simple matter. I've taken the bolts out already. There's two down here, by the way. Don't forget that. And then off with the front cover. Let's get the, uh, pry this off. Now keep in mind, there are dowel pins. So you don't want to just be prying on this thing because these dowel pins down here are important. And you don't want to mess them up because they got to be, even though the rest of the engine's not going to get reused, these are. All right, ah, there it is. Oh, this is a nice surprise. Look at this. Okay, these typically, these 440s with hydraulic cams in motorhomes or whatever, will have something called a silent chain, which is basically a single row chain with a plastic top gear. And they're called silent chains because that nylon faced top gear absorbs noise and runs quietly. Well, this is a double row. Look at this, two rows of teeth, a double roller chain, so somebody's either been in here or it's possible. See that Pentastar, that's a Chrysler top gear right there. And again, this is double roller stuff, that, that's Pentastar. It's conceivable, maybe the motorhomes did get the double roller stuff, but this typically would be found like in a Hemi. Uh, most of the 440s is a single row chain. So kind of weird, but again, you never know sometimes what's been done. Now the downside, let's look at this slop right here. Look at this chain, look at that. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. And what that really tells us is that the cam timing and the crankshaft position are going to be in the ballpark, but not that precise. So when you're on and off the gas, the cam and the crank will be in and out of phase a degree or two, but that's the, that's the downside of a worn out timing chain right there. And you know, some guys will put a chain or a gear drive on the front of a car to get rid of this kind of a problem right here, but the gear drives introduce their own world of problems. Uh, complexity, noise, and in some cases, they set up harmonics that can break valve springs and stuff like that. So gear drives are sometimes used, you can hear them. Uh, but with that said, I, I'll take a double roller chain any day. Okay, let's knock this uh, gear off of here real quick. Just take that nut off of its spot. And then, keep going. So yeah, one thing about this too we notice is this has a yeah, single bolt right here holding, yeah, there we go, that's good. 
Um, yeah, there's, that's a single bolt cam. Uh, Hemis, max wedges, and I think six packs had three bolt top gears. Uh, but again, pedestrian engines, 440, four barrels, just regular stuff, just had this regular single bolt. But again, six packs, I think, had the triple bolt. Hemis and max wedges, again, you'd find three bolts up top here. And it doesn't really make much difference, but uh, some folks say that the three bolt stuff's a little more durable and stuff. So there's that. And, and again, I don't use air tools because, uh, I don't know, I just like to be more in tune with it and the noise bothers me too. But, uh, okay, yeah. This comes off and then voila. So there's that right there. And again, here's that double row routine right there and the chain double rollers here. And again, the beauty here is that these things are, you know, not indestructible. I mean, they can stretch, we saw that, but uh, they're certainly, uh, you know, better than a single row. Okay, the next step on this puppy, uh, next video, we're gonna roll this thing over, pull the pan, yank the rods and pistons and crank, and take it right down to the very barest essentials. Now, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the Steve Magsy YouTube channel. And uh, if you haven't seen us so far, oh, binge away. There's lots of stuff to see, including uh, oh, about 12, 13, 14 videos that got us to this point with Project Ram Charger. So tune in, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you for the next one.